The Husband by Anton Chekhov In the course of the maneuvers, the N Cavalry Regiment halted for a night at the district town of K. Such an event as the visit of officers always has the most exciting and inspiring effect on the inhabitants of provincial towns. The shopkeepers dream of getting rid of their rusty sausages and best brand sardines that have been lying for ten years on their shelves. The inns and restaurants keep open all night. The military commandant, his secretary, and the local garrison put on their best uniforms. The police flit to and fro like mad, while the effect on the ladies is beyond all description. The ladies of K, hearing the regiment approaching, forsook their pans of boiling jam and ran into the street. Forgetting their morning deshabille and general untidiness, they rushed breathless with excitement to meet the regiment and listened greedily to the band playing the march. Looking at their pale, ecstatic faces, one might have thought those strains came from some heavenly choir, rather from a military brass band. The regiment, they cried joyfully, the regiment is coming! What could this unknown regiment that came by chance today and would depart at dawn tomorrow, mean to them. Afterwards, when the officers were standing in the middle of the square, and with their hands behind them, discussing the question of billets, all the ladies were gathered together at the examining magistrates, and vying with one another in their criticisms of the regiment. They already knew, goodness knows how, that the colonel was married but not living with his wife that the senior officer's wife had a baby born dead every year, that the adjutant was hopelessly in love with some countess and had even once attempted suicide. They knew everything. When a pockmarked soldier in a red shirt darted past the windows, they knew for certain that it was Lieutenant Rimzov's orderly, running about the town trying to get some English bitter ale on tick for his master. They had only caught a passing glimpse of the officers' backs, but had already decided that there was not one handsome or interesting man among them. Having talked to their heart's content, they sent for the military commandant and the committee of the club, and instructed them at all costs to make arrangements for a dance. Their wishes were carried out. At nine o'clock in the evening, the military band was playing in the street before the club, while in the club itself, the officers were dancing with the ladies of K. The ladies felt as though they were on wings. Intoxicated by the dancing, the music, and the clank of spurs, they threw themselves heart and soul into making the acquaintance of their new partners, and quite forgot their old civilian friends. Their fathers and husbands, forced temporarily into the background, crowded round the meager refreshment table in the entrance hall. All these government cashiers, secretaries, clerks, and superintendents, stale, sickly-looking, clumsy figures, were perfectly well aware of their inferiority. They did not even enter the ballroom, but contented themselves with watching their wives and daughters in the distance, dancing with the accomplished and graceful officers. Among the husbands was Shalikov, the tax collector, a narrow, spiteful soul, given to drink, with a big, closely cropped head and thick, protruding lips. He had had a university education. There had been a time when he used to read progressive literature and sing student songs, but now, as he said of himself, he was a tax collector and nothing more. He stood leaning against the doorpost, his eyes fixed on his wife, Anna Pavlovna, a little brunette of thirty, with a long nose and a pointed chin. Tightly laced, with her face carefully powdered, she danced without pausing for breath, danced till she was ready to drop exhausted. But though she was exhausted in body, her spirit was inexhaustible. One could see as she danced that her thoughts were with the past, that far away past when she used to dance at the College for Young Ladies, dreaming of a life of luxury and gaiety, and never doubting that her husband was to be a prince, or at worst, a baron. The tax collector watched, scowling with spite. 
It was not jealousy he was feeling. He was ill-humored. First, because the room was taken up with dancing and there was nowhere he could play a game of cards. Secondly, because he could not endure the sound of wind instruments. And thirdly, because he fancied the officers treated the civilians somewhat too casually and disdainfully. But what above everything revolted him and moved him to indignation was the expression of happiness on his wife's face. It makes me sick to look at her, he muttered. Going on for forty and nothing to boast of at any time, and she must powder her face and lace herself up and frizzing her hair. Flirting and making faces and fancying she's doing the thing in style. Oh, you're a pretty figure upon my soul. Anna Pavlovna was so lost in the dance that she did not once glance at her husband. Of course not. Where do we poor country bumpkins come in, sneered the tax collector. We are at a discount now. We're clumsy seals, unpolished provincial bears, and she's the queen of the ball. She has kept enough of her looks to please even officers. They'd not object to making love to her, I dare say. During the mazurka, the tax collector's face twitched with spite. A black-haired officer with prominent eyes and tartar cheekbones danced the mazurka with Anna Pavlovna. Assuming a stern expression, he worked his legs with gravity and feeling, and so crooked his knees that he looked like a jack dandy pulled by strings. While Anna Pavlovna, pale and thrilled, bending her figure languidly and turning her eyes up, tried to look as though she scarcely touched the floor and evidently felt herself that she was not on earth, not at the local club, but somewhere far, far away, in the clouds. Not only her face, but her whole figure was expressive of beatitude. The tax collector could endure it no longer. He felt a desire to jeer at that beatitude, to make Anna Pavlovna feel that she had forgotten herself that life was by no means so delightful as she fancied now in her excitement. You wait. I'll teach you to smile so blissfully, he muttered. You are not a boarding school, miss. You are not a girl. An old fright ought to realize she is a fright. Petty feelings of envy, vexation, Wounded vanity of that small provincial misanthropy engendered in petty officials by vodka and a sedentary life swarmed in his heart like mice. Waiting for the end of the mazurka, he went into the hall and walked up to his wife. Anna Pavlovna was sitting with her partner, and, flirting her fan and coquettishly dropping her eyelids, was describing how she used to dance in Petersburg, her lips were pursed like a rosebud, and she pronounced, At home in Petersburg. Anuta, let us go home, croaked the tax collector. Seeing her husband standing before her, Anna Pavlovna started, as though recalling the fact that she had a husband. Then she flushed all over. She felt ashamed that she had such a sickly-looking, ill-humored, ordinary husband. Let us go home, repeated the tax collector. Why? It's quite early. I beg you to come home, said the tax collector deliberately, with a spiteful expression. Why? Has anything happened? Anna Pavlovna asked in a flutter. Nothing has happened, but I wish you to go home at once. I wish it. That's enough. And without further talk, please. Anna Pavlovna was not afraid of her husband, but she felt ashamed on account of her partner, who was looking at her husband with surprise and amusement. She got up and moved a little apart with her husband. "'What notion is this?' she began. "'Why go home? Why, it's not even eleven o'clock. I wish it, and that's enough. Come along, and that's all about it. Don't be silly. Go home alone if you want to.' "'All right.' and I shall make a scene. 
The tax collector saw the look of beatitude gradually vanish from his wife's face, saw how ashamed and miserable she was, and he felt a little happier. Why do you want me at once? asked his wife. I don't want you, but I wish you to be at home. I wish it, that's all. At first, Anna Pavlovna refused to hear of it. Then she began entreating her husband to let her stay just another half an hour. Then, without knowing why, she began to apologize, to protest, and all in a whisper, with a smile, that the spectators might not suspect that she was having a tiff with her husband. She began assuring him she would not stay long, only another ten minutes, only five minutes. But the tax collector stuck obstinately to his point. Stay if you like, he said, but I'll make a scene if you do. As she talked to her husband, Anna Pavlovna looked thinner, older, plainer, pale, biting her lips and almost crying. She went out to the entry and began putting on her things. You're not going, asked the ladies in surprise. Anna Pavlovna, you're not going, dear. Her head aches, said the tax collector for his wife. Coming out of the club, the husband and wife walked all the way home in silence. The tax collector walked behind his wife, and watching her downcast, sorrowful, humiliated little figure, he recalled the look of beatitude which had so irritated him at the club, and the consciousness that the beatitude was gone filled his soul with triumph. He was pleased and satisfied, and at the same time he felt the lack of something. He would have liked to go back to the club and make everyone feel dreary and miserable, so that all might know how stale and worthless life is when you walk along the streets in the dark and hear the slush of the mud under your feet, and when you know that you will wake up next morning with nothing to look forward to but vodka and cards. Oh, how awful it is! And Anna Pavlovna could scarcely walk. She was still under the influence of the dancing, the music, the talk, the lights, and the noise. She asked herself as she walked along why God had thus afflicted her. She felt miserable, insulted, and choking with hate as she listened to her husband's heavy footsteps. She was silent, trying to think of the most offensive, biting, and venomous word she could hurl at her husband, and at the same time she was fully aware that no word could penetrate her tax collector's hide. What did he care for words? Her bitterest enemy could not have contrived for her a more helpless position. And meanwhile, the band was playing, and the darkness was full of the most rousing, intoxicating dance tunes. End of The Husband by Anton Chekhov This is a LibriVox recording.